Okay, ladies and gentlemen, for our first panel, um, we have African Perspectives on Democracy, Security, and Global Governance. Our first panel list is Pearl Robinson. Where is she? Okay. She may be getting herself a cup of coffee. Okay. Okay. Our second panel list is Sindiso Menensi Weeks. Cindy Sominenzi Weeks is an assistant professor here at UMass Boston in the public policy and excluded populations uh, in the School of Global Inclusion and Social Development here at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Thank you. She's, here. She's in here yet either, okay. okay. I'm actually gonna go usher people here. Okay. Our third panelist is Nada Mustafa Ali. And with Nada Mustafi Ali, she teaches in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department and is an affiliated faculty in the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at UMass Boston, where she's also a faculty fellow in the Center for Governance and Sustainability. Ali's teaching covers the areas of gender, culture, and power in Africa and global intersectionality, critical development studies, human rights, and qualitative research. She is working on digital ethnographic Oh my gosh, sorry. Ethnography on women, social media, and activism in contemporary Sudan, and gender militarization and peace building in Sudan and South Sudan, and gender and HIV AIDS in the Middle East and Africa. And our final panelist here is Michael Woldemeriam. Walter Merriam is Assistant Professor of International Relations at the Frederick S. Pardee School, Global Studies at, the, at uh, Boston University. And finally, Dr. Darren Koo. Darren Koo is the Associate Professor and the Chair in the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance, and the Executive Director of the Center for Peace, Democracy, and Development at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And moderating this event will be Dr. Adozi. Questions prepared for our panelists. And we're just looking for people to pick out the questions randomly that I can run to Dr. Adozi, and she will address the panel. So we thought we might have Anybody? a yes, here we an are. interactive um, um, discussion about African Democracy, security, and um, what was the last theme on, on this panel? Security, democracy, development, development sure. governance, governance, governance. Okay, and so um, we, we did want um, each of the panelists to um, answer a first question for us though, right? Right, um, um, Jason? And so that first question you have, because I don't have a list of the questions. So if you can bring your magic basket, your calabash, you know, your <laughs> and I can remind myself of what that question is. But it is the introductory question. And, and you know, if I remember, the question um, asked uh, each of you to introduce your research and your teaching and your programming by way of um, the study of Africa um, and especially um, the theme Pan Africa Rising. So, why don't I ask um, Dr. Uh, Darren Q to begin? Um, just one minute, if you don't mind, each of you, so that we can get to these, you know, several 12 questions that we have for you. Okay? Sure. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Darren Q, and uh, I've been working on Africa related issues for over 25 years now, uh, particularly in Nigeria. Uh, where I've uh, studied the role of civil society and democracy building and conflict resolution. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, I've, I've shifted a little bit towards working on Muslim-Christian dialogue, uh, again in Nigeria, uh, in Kaduna. We just finished a very large project working with some peace organizations there. Uh, much of my writing is focused on civil society and now more, more recently uh, interreligious dialogue. Uh, I've also uh, monitored uh, every Nigerian election since 1993 at the national level, and I, I just uh, got off the plane yesterday from uh, <laughs> observing the latest election, uh, which was just there uh, on Saturday. Um, so um, if I look a little bit uh, deer in the headlights, it's partly the, the jet mm -hmm. lag. Um, but thank you very much. 
Yeah, welcome back, Darren. Um, and please, uh, you have to update me on the elections. Who really won, um, Atiku or Buhari? Nothing? <laughs> OK, <Let's> later. <laughs> OK, Cindy, so please. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Cindy Somnisi Weeks, and um, I'm in the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development. So my background is in law and anthropology, or legal anthropology. Um, and I study the relationship between um, traditional and indigenous legal systems in South Africa and the South African um, state system, particularly looking at human rights um, and women's rights um, even more particularly. And so um, what I've looked at are a wide array of matters to do with um, the way in which traditional communities in South Africa govern themselves um, and how that is regulated by the state and how that sort of um, create some um, tensions with um, the ways in which the state's normative systems may actually conceive of um, traditional identity in communities as a, 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 a throwback in some ways from the colonial um, and apartheid regimes as opposed to the way that traditional communities are um, continuing to reform themselves and um, transforming their own identities and their own normative systems. And so governance ends up being a really important part of that because um, of the way in which decision making is done in traditional communities as contrasted with the way that it might be done in um, a formal uh, you know, state system. And so um, I guess as relates to the theme of Pan-Africa Rising, um, I think many of the conversations that are happening in South Africa, especially at this time, considering um, South Africa's uh, sort of unique positionality with on the African continent, um, creates a sort of blurring in some ways between South Africans' position as being, you know, previously oppressed peoples who are trying to sort of recreate um, their own statehood and their own identities um, as free peoples, but at the same time also being very um, plugged into the neoliberal order um, that is the sort of prevailing global political economy and themselves also then engaging in imperialist practices in other parts of Africa. And so um, I think that that creates some interesting things to think about within the context of this theme. Thank you. Nada. Hello, um, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, by the way, um, and to be part of this um, important event. Uh, I teach in the Women's uh, and Gender and Sexuality Studies Department here at UMass Boston. And um, although I'm trained as a political scientist, most of my teaching and research is actually in interdisciplinary areas. So I've been working um, you know, within the interdisciplinary um, fields of uh, development studies, human rights, and obviously women's um, and gender studies. Um, uh, I teach um, about uh, the Middle East and Africa, but I also uh, like to um, approach uh, questions uh, in other regions of the world uh, as they affect um, you know, women and other communities within um, Africa as well. Um, I'm currently working on a number of um, uh, research projects, but um, the main project I'm focusing on is actually on social uh, media and social movements. So I'm really interested in African and Pan-African uprisings. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the reason I got interested in this uh, project is that um, following the, Afri the spring, the Arab Spring, um, and the protests that took place in um, uh, the Middle East and North Africa, I got interested in how um, social media may actually facilitate organizing and mobilization towards social um, change and transformation. Uh, but I came across uh, groups on Facebook uh, that actually focus on um, women's bodies and body aesthetics in Sudan. And the question um, I've been approaching is, um, you know, to what extent would such uh, groupings um, and the kind of issues that they discuss contribute to um, reinforcing stereotypes and negative perceptions of the body and um, of uh, women? Um, femininity and masculinity in countries like Sudan and beyond, or whether these could be platforms where women could actually exchange knowledge, uh, engage in um, self-care, and also maybe dream, um, you know, strategies for mobilization uh, towards change and transformation, especially in Sudan. And uh, I think um, events that took place in 2016 and ongoing protests in Sudan are kind of providing a preliminary answer to my question. 
um, because uh, young women organize, young women members of these groups on Facebook have been really uh, vocal in, within the protests and have um, you know contributed in many ways to um, the success of the uprising in Sudan right now. Maybe I will talk about that a little later. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Michael. Great, thanks uh, for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Wildemarium, uh, and I uh, teach at uh, Boston University's uh, Party School of Global Studies. Uh, so my sort of research and teaching interests focus on the Horn of Africa primarily, uh, and issues uh, related to conflict uh, and security. Uh, so some of my early work uh, looked at rebel movements in that region, uh, so uh, particularly in Ethiopia, Somalia, although I've, I've done quite a bit of work in Sudan as well. Uh, so looking at, you know, why these rebel movements emerged, um, how they evolved over time, uh, how their behavior shaped uh, the nature of the conflicts that they were operating within, uh, and then what, what these groups often did uh, when the conflict ended. Uh, and in the Horn, we have a, a number of governments that actually used to be re rebel movements, so that's, that's actually quite a relevant question. Uh, more recently, uh, I focused, and this is probably more germane to the question of, of Pan-Africa rising, but uh, more recently, I focused on issues of sort of related to the international relations of the Horn of Africa. There's kind of a, you could say this about the, the, the continent more generally, but there is sort of a new geopolitics, I think, affecting the Horn. Sort of extra regional players that are increasingly influential. China, of course, uh, the United States. The United States' uh, major uh, military facility in Africa is based in the Horn of Africa, in Djibouti. Um, but then also middle powers like uh, like Arab countries, uh, the UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of, I'm looking at sort of uh, that sort of new geopolitics and, and particularly how it's affecting countries in the region in terms of governance, democracy, development, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I also originally hail from the region. I should probably put that out there. Uh, so I'm Eritrean uh, by origin. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so that's me. Thank you. And Pearl, do you want to, or um, go ahead. I'll try in a minute. a minute. And then uh, uh, Jason, get ready. <laughs> in terms of the, the things that I have studied, I started studying politics under one party states. I studied military rule. I studied transitions to democracy. I did that for one of those election monitorings with Darren in Nigeria. Um, I've done, and, and now I'm focusing on two things. I wanted to study Muslim women and a Muslim majority democracy in Niger, and I stumbled on this movement that had been there that I hadn't seen for 30 years, uh, Tijania Women's Movement, and it ended up being a movie. So I never made a movie before this, but I have done a 40-minute documentary movie in Hausa language called Mama Chota, and it's Mama Chota's message of female empowerment, and I've taken it on the road House of speaking audiences in Niger and Nigeria. Um, and uh, the movie has, in, I've actually watched it transform politics of Muslim women in Niger in ways I won't go into. And my university at Tufts was so impressed with what this woman has been doing for the past 50 years, they created a new award and she became the, glo the inaugural recipient of Tufts Global Humanitarian Citizen Award. Okay. Uh, it's picked up in newspapers in West Africa. And this, this is one of my things that I refer to as diaspora work. It turns out that my interest in women's empowerment and what Mama Chilta had been doing, and my seeing it and finding a way uh, to make it not available particularly to the people I usually, my audiences, but the target audience was uh, Hausa speaking people in West Africa. I'm now working on an English version, which seems to be harder to do because I don't have part good partners like I had in this year, <laughs> and in the Ralph Bunch project. The other two quick things I'll say, I spent eight years uh, working in the field of higher education in Africa. That's when I taught at University of Dar es Salaam and, and Makerere University, and was with the program of uh, major American foundations made a $100 million commitment to transforming higher education in Africa. And my piece was uh, we set up the very first computer lab in the Faculty of Social Sciences at McKinney, and then also introduced online teaching and learning with 
in political science, I was doing African international relations courses at DAR and Tanzania. So it brought me into the sector of African higher education, which over 40 years I paid no attention to when I was doing my research. You get the research affiliation and you pay no attention. Uh, and so I now have a number of African colleagues in universities in Africa, and that's another sector that I'm interested in. And there are just all kinds of ways that people at universities uh, can bring value and bring value in two different, both directions if you get involved in that sector. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, um, uh, panelists. Uh, some great backgrounds. And uh, certainly, um, you're going to help us to facilitate um, a discussion, um, a vibrant discussion on um, um, African democracy. Um, governance and uh, security issues. And so like we said, um, we had about 12 questions for each panel. Um, I know we may not be able to get to all 12 questions, but we'd like to uh, try. And, and the other thing is that we wanted to do this uh, democratically, so we've asked you to pick out at least um, the questions. And so I do have a first question, although this is number, question number 10. Um, so um, I, I, I pose the questions to any of the panelists that may want to respond to them, but hopefully um, this can also be um, a Q&A as well. Okay, which of these countries deserves to be elected permanent membership to the United Nations Security Council? Sounds like something like And the Nigeria question, uh, the countries are <laughs> South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt, and and because um, I know that Darren would, um, you know, itch to, you know, sort of respond to this question vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in Nigeria as of just yesterday in terms of the elections. Um, maybe we could start with you, um, and and the question was, you know, which deserves to be um, a permanent member of the United Nations. I mean, as, as Professor Robinson says, certainly Nigerians would argue very strongly <laughs> that Nigeria, just by its sheer size, uh, you know, deserves to have that place. Uh, its military is certainly one of the largest on the continent. Mm -hmm. um, but if you actually look at its profile, most of the Nigerian military is actually committed within Nigeria itself. Um, some, some 32 of Nigeria's 36 states uh, have military deployments um, outside of the election period. Um, so because of this, this sort of self-absorption, um, for good reason of the Nigerian military. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense under sort of the current arrangement where there's a rotation uh, among those. Certainly Nigeria needs to be in the conversation, needs to be in the mix. Uh, it plays a very important role in ECOWAS in, in West Africa in particular. Um, but at the same time, it, it clearly cannot take up the, the mantle uh, that would be uh, appropriate for its size. Um, when, it's, when its economy and its, and its institutions, I think, take on the sort of strength where it's able to do uh, what perhaps the role it's played in the past and the role that it should play in the future, then I think that that, that would be time for that conversation to take place. Do you place. want to spend one minute or so just uh, speaking or reflecting on the <laughs> elections that you monitored? Um, sure, yeah. Well, yeah. so um, Nigeria had national elections uh, just over the weekend, and it looks like uh, President Buhari has been uh, re-elected. Uh, I think what's particularly interesting about this election uh, is that we've seen the election commission has increased uh, in its quality. Uh, it's particularly introduced a number of um, electronic uh, innovations, uh, particularly an electronic card reader um, that has made it harder uh, for the political parties to rig, which is what their standard operating procedure has been uh, in most of the elections uh, that's out there. Um, but what we've seen this time around, unlike in 2015, is that the parties have improved their capacity to try to get around uh, the new technical rules. Uh, we've seen how these voter cards uh, have been captured by the political parties. And lo and behold, most of the card readers had technical malfunctions uh, across the country. Uh, somewhere anywhere between 50 to 80 percent of them uh, nationwide had problems, uh, which meant that uh, if individuals, uh, which we do have evidence that the political parties had been capturing these voter cards, uh, had been given those, uh, including children, to vote, um, then they would not be, they would show up as legitimate voters on the voting rolls. Uh, a number of different states across the Federation uh, had particularly problematic situations where our, our observers in Katsina State, for instance, saw uh, party officials uh, sitting there instructing people where to vote and put their finger on the proper spot for the ruling party um, in, in Katsina State. 
Um, mm. In other instances, we saw places where um, uh, the party would show up with a van full of, of voters' cards and would distribute those and then would pay people afterwards. Um, the other issue that was a very important part of this, this election was vote buying. Um, it, was, it was rampant across the country. Anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 Naira for your vote uh, was being offered in, in a variety of creative ways uh, around uh, the country. So what this means overall is that it's clear that the, the system has been compromised, but we just don't know the extent of it. Um, so how, how extensive is the problem with this voter card uh, issue? Is it, is it 3%, is it 5%, is it 50%? Uh, we just don't know. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that, the, that, the, that both uh, President Buhari and his challenger, uh, former Vice President Atiku, were pretty evenly matched. Uh, some polls showed uh, Buhari ahead, some polls showed Atiku ahead. It was a very close election, so we just don't know uh, who would have been the, uh, the real victor. Um, one, one, I think, important thing to end up is that um, certainly um, civil society played a very important role again, and uh, the sort of citizen engagement in the election are two really bright spots, I think, that we'll see uh, in terms of future election quality. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, so South Africa is on the list. Any comments? <laughs> well, I think South Africa would, would make a strong pitch for that position and say that um, for many of the reasons that Darren said um, that Nigeria may be ill-suited, South Africa would actually be very well-suited um, to step into that role. But I guess I find myself a little bit um, skeptical about the question itself, and I guess um, that's partly because uh, I'm uh, somewhat unsure that the permanent membership um, of the Security Council as like a structural feature of the United Nations is actually a very compelling one. Um, and so I guess I would uh, want to interrogate that first before we were even thinking about, um, you know, which country is appropriate. So that's just me. No, thank you. Um, um, there's Egypt. Um, do, Michael, do you want to speak to um, or, or Nada? You can go. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think, uh, I mean, I, I would certainly probably agree with, with Darren that, you know, the, the current structure, the current system of sort of rotating membership for three African countries is probably best. Just at a practical level, I don't think you could get uh, 54 African countries to agree on, on who should actually, uh, uh, I mean, this has, been, this has been a topic of discussion for some time, and, mm -hmm. and, and the major countries actually can't agree on who should have permanent membership uh, in, in, within the AU. You could play with the idea, perhaps, of longer terms uh, for African countries, because uh, the, the problem is once they get on the UN Security Council, they've got like one or two years, and really can't really can't develop a long-term agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you know, you you could play with that. Um, but one thing I would say, uh, I think there, if, if we're going to have the debate, actually have this debate about what country should be um, uh, a permanent member uh, within the UN Security Council, wh why not perhaps a, a horn country, Ethiopia, right? because Ethiopia is the seat of the African Union. Uh, it's the second most populous country in Africa. Um, but it has a, 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 a kind of, it, it, it is really sort of invested in the idea of African multilateralism because it is the seat of, of yeah. the AU. It's, it's interested in preserving its integrity as an actual institution rather than just thinking of it as a vehicle for pursuing its own national interests. I mean, it does that on some level, obviously, mm -hmm. but it is it's particularly invested in the AU as an institution. So, you know, Maybe, maybe Ethiopia should be in the conversation as well, if Absolutely. we're going to have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Nada. Yeah, I just wanted to add one uh, point, and uh, I think that I agree with um, Sindisu that it's important um, that we think about the importance of uh, restructuring um, the Security Council. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, Nigeria has argued for that recently. Um, the representative of uh, Nigeria on the ECOWAS, uh, Dr. Nuruddin, has um, suggested that uh, a restructuring of uh, the African, uh, sorry, the Security Council would allow, um, you know, better engagement of African countries with um, this institution. And um, my second point is that maybe um, various African countries could take a leaf from the experiences of um, the international women's movement, uh, which includes African women's um, organizations, um, you know, and the way it has engaged uh, the Security Council in other ways. Uh, so um, after the Beijing conference in 1995, there was a campaign um, to get the Security Council to adopt its first resolution on women, peace, and security, for example. And the way women's organizations worked at different levels regionally, 
uh, and also at the grassroots level, um, you know, including reaching out to women at the village level, mm. uh, documenting women's um, experiences uh, during war, for example, women's experiences in terms of peace building in Africa has actually contributed to um, issuing this uh, resolution and subsequent resolutions as well. And so this is another way, um, you know, Africa could engage the Security Council. Perfect, thank you. We're ready for our next question. Um, next and question? Yah is going to, um, okay. We have a next question from the people. Okay, <laughs> is the Africa Rising thesis an ideal way to describe contemporary African um, global political economics? Uh, is Africa Rising useful? Um, is Africa rising? Are people to attack your thesis? Um, well, uh, no, my thesis is Pan-Africa rising. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so Africa rising, the, the Africa rising, I mean, we still use it, um, Africa rising, and many Africans, you know, like the notion that um, Africa is finally be, being seen in a positive light, right? You know, and, um, but on the other hand, um, it's also criticized. Um, and, and, you know, maybe tell us um, whether or not it's actually true. I mean, is Africa um, economically growing um, evenly across? Is it still growing? Um, just some responses and discussion points on the Africa rising trope. Thank you. Anyone? I'll be second. <laughs> I think we're all ready, actually. So, yeah. okay. so um, I think that, um, as uh, you said, Professor uh, Idozi, mm -hmm. um, to start with, there are there were many circles um, within the African continent and amongst the African diaspora who were excited about this idea of Africa rising, because it challenged the dominant view about Africa as a homogeneous uh, continent, first right. of all, but also as um, you know, uh, a continent that is marred by uh, poverty, sickness, and you know, ill health, and so on, right. conflicts and right. abuses of human rights. Um, but then, uh, looking at the origins of this idea itself, I think it is rooted in uh, neoliberal um, ideologies and yep. thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it actually defined development as merely um, high rates of economic growth, which was happening when it first came yeah. up, right? Um, it's, uh, and this economic growth actually resulted from the production of a limited range of com commodities or the use of the extractive industries, right? So yeah. there was no um, uh, industrialization per se, um, as well as increased foreign investment within uh, the continent. Um, it has, uh, the continent itself has also been uh, perceived as a global um, consumer market according to this um, idea. And so, um, of course, uh, Professor Idoza, I read parts of your book, you challenged this um, um, you know, uh, construction you know, of the idea itself by introducing the concept or the idea of Pan-Africa um, rising. And this is a, an interesting, um, so an interesting um, you know, line of analysis. Uh, but I, what I would like to um, add to that is uh, to what extent can ideas about human development and, I, and economics as if all people mattered help us further engage the question of development um, mm. in Africa? And how can, um, you know, gendered, again, uh, womanist or feminist analysis um, that views development itself as gendered and racialized as a discourse embedded in power, right? Sure. How can such understandings help us further uh, these models or think about um, alternatives, mm -hmm. right? How can we really think of ways these and other frameworks may help us challenge mm -hmm. intersecting inequalities within Africa? Because okay. this economic growth has actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, exacerbated economic yeah. inequalities within yeah. um, the continent itself. One final point is, um, and, and I think in your book you do mention the idea of ujama, and it is linked. Ujama, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. ujama, uh, which, um, uh, I call it you, Jama'a. No, you know? okay. Yeah, Mu'allim Nairiri, the former president of Nairi of uh, Tanzania, mm -hmm. actually, um, you know, advanced in or introduced in post-colonial uh, Tanzania. I think that was very useful. And to what extent would it be possible to actually advance these ideas of Jama'a or African socialism, although this is contested, um, you know, in contemporary Africa? Okay. okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead, Sandisa. Yes. 
So, um, I mean, I, I think I would uh, agree with a lot of what Nada said, um, and of course a lot of what your, your critique is against it, especially the part about um, the fact that, you know, there are differences when the narrative is coming from internally versus when it's coming from outside. And I think that um, one of the challenges of the narrative coming from outside is, is how, how is that even defined? And the point that Nada makes about the sort of neoliberal um, constructs that are applied to conceiving of Africa as rising in this moment are um, particularly um, problematic, especially insofar as what we see on the ground, um, you know, in, in African um, communities sort of experiencing an, a renewed sort of gold rush experience, as it were, right, in terms of um, outside actors in the name of foreign direct investment and contributing to the development of Africa um, are seizing land and displacing people and um, uh, compromising people's um, safety and security in a variety of ways. And so I think, um, I think that that creates um, concerns, right? And, and so I, I guess what it leaves me wondering about is, um, if we are going to talk about Africa rising, um, at what point are we, are we going to be able to talk about it in terms of Africa rising on its own terms? Um, and funnily enough, the thought that came to mind was um, Black Panther. Because um, mm -hmm. you know Black Panther had to come up at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in terms of the movie, some of the critique um, that was leveled against it was the fact that you know, it's the sort of, uh, in some ways, uneasy merger of, you know, Africa rising on its own terms or an African country being, um, you know, finally recognized and seen for its contributions on its own terms, but still, you know, integrating all of these sort of Western ideals of technological advancement in the form of, you know, fill in the blank. And so right. um, I think that it, in some ways it's the sort of Black Panther quandary that yeah. Africa is faced with when we're talking about Africa rising. And I think the question that we have to come back to is what does it mean, what does it look like for Africa to rise on its own terms and according to its own definitions? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we have another question. Thank you. Okay, is the African Union relevant? That's a good question. Let's go for you, Michael, to start that one. <laughs> tough, tough question. Um, well, actually not that tough. I mean, my first answer would be, my initial response is sort of absolutely, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. think, I think it is. If, if you compare the African Union to its predecessor organization, the Organization of African Unity, I mean, the, the African Union is a, is a vast improvement, right? Um, if you look at, for instance, uh, you know, its capacity. I mean, if you look at the AU's actual founding charter, right, it enables, it gives it the, the African Union enhanced powers to actually, you know, engage member states in their conflicts and, 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 and deal with issues of peace and security internal to those countries, right? I mean, the criticism of the Organization of African Unity in decades past was that it was basically a protection racket uh, for incumbent African elites. And I think, if you, again, if you look at the founding documents of the AU, that shift has occurred involved in peacekeeping, right? It has a far larger, far, far more significant bureaucratic capacity, right? If you just look at the Secretariat of the African Union, um, it has great symbolic power, agenda setting capacity. If we look now, for instance, on the issue of migration uh, and the way in which the EU, we could talk more about this, but the EU has a particular vision of what migration management looks like. And, and, the, and the African countries through the African Union have developed a common position to push back on that, particularly when we talk about reception centers in particular African countries like Libya or in the Sahel. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I would say it's not perfect, obviously. And what are the challenges? There are a number of challenges. Obviously, like any international institution or international organization comprised of member states, it's really a product, of, it's the sum of its parts, right? So, you know, if member states uh, are not interested in doing certain things, that's going to be a challenge. And also there's a question of ownership. I mean, the AU, depends on external uh, resourcing, right? Uh, that's still the case. I mean, they're trying to develop an agenda of, of, of you know, building you know, their own re internal revenue generation capacity. I think pa Paul Kagame uh, has been mm -hmm. championing this. I know he's a con controversial figure, obviously. But um, so again, there are problems, but a significant improvement on what we've had at, at, uh, in the past. And it's, you know, it's, it has some tangible achievements, absolutely. Thank you. May I ask you a question? Sure. sure. So does the AU have a policy 
an African policy on how to handle the threats of Islamic uh, terrorism or disruption. What, what sort of bothers me is the United States has a policy to keep us safe here. We're building the largest missile base that the United States has any place out of the United States in Niger, and it will be the second base. And that has completely destroyed life for people in Niger. Maybe completely is, is a, a bit of a, a stretch, but not much. We have a right to go and do that in African countries. Does the AU have a policy on what it thinks should be happening within the continent? And, and it's, you seem to be working on that, so I'm going to be talking to you about this more. Because, and if so, if, if, they, if, if they do, I'd like to know what it is. And if not, what, what are the structures, or, or is there a process for trying to come to grips with this, or is it even an issue they feel they can address? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, there are obviously our policy documents uh, that exist. Uh, there are debates that, been ha that have occurred in the Peace and Security Council of the African Union on this particular issue, the question of terrorism and particularly like counterterrorism collaboration with the United States or other, other uh, non-African players. Um, but I, I wouldn't say there's a really coherent policy on how to deal with terrorism. I mean, there are also like certain CVE initiatives that exist, countering violent extremism. You also have them at the, um, the level of regional organizations. So EGAD in the Horn of Africa, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, also has one uh, that they collaborate with, you know, a certain initiative that they collaborate with the African Union on. But, but I think one of the issues has been, um, if, if you think about sort of the war on terror and sort of, you know, the way in which the tentacles of our own sort of, the, by, by our own, I mean the United States, its national security apparatus sort of spread across the continent. That was coterminous with the actual creation of the African Union, right? So I think it was also an issue of timing that the African Union was still in its formative stage and was not really able to grapple with this particular issue. But I, I see a difference with the migration question, for instance. I mean, the African Union is a little more aggressive now in dealing with that issue. On terrorism, I think states, uh, African states oftentimes deal bilaterally uh, with the United States or their countries on that particular issue. That would be my sense, but maybe I'm, I'm mischaracterizing Dar the with, state of play. Um, dealing with Boko Haram in Ni Nigeria, anything to say? Um, in terms of the African Union, I mean, I would, I would certainly uh, underscore, I mean, what you said, and I, I'd really underline the, I think, the legitimation role that the AU plays. I think that uh, the United Nations and a lot of regional actors um, look very closely to the AU to provide that. And I think it's not simply just uh, window dressing. I think that that role of, of providing that kind of regional legitimacy has been tremendously important uh, in terms of the, the efficacy of, of a lot of the peacekeeping operations. But um, also, too, I mean, the African Union's mediation efforts across the continent um, have been tremendously important. Um, not always successful. We don't hear a lot about them. Uh, but nonetheless, it's been a, a really important actor in trying to keep the countries to have an ongoing conversation. Um, in terms of sort of you know, Boko Haram and, and other issues, um, that particular problem has tended to be um, uh, focused on more in a, in a multilateral sense um, with the French, the Americans, the British working with Cameroon, Chad, Niger, yeah. and Nigeria mm -hmm. and sort of regional um, uh, arrangements. Um, but the African Union has been in the background mm -hmm. in, in some of these conversations. And I think my impression is that all of these actors have the African Union in mind as a vehicle if some sort of a peace operation or some sort of amnesty program, something along those lines uh, could move forward. And I think, you know, that's one issue that I think comes up again and again that, that's, that's being struggled with is I think many governments tend to fall on the side of, of a military um, a solution to this, constantly saying we're going to crush them. It's the same thing with al-Shabaab. And mm -hmm. in the end, you know, like, like the mm -hmm. rest of the world, um, yeah. when it comes to these sort of uh, movements, in the end, you have to negotiate at some point. Yeah. So engaging some sort of a negotiation strategy, mm -hmm. Nigeria has been on and off about that. Boko Haram has also sent feelers saying, look, we want to talk yeah. uh, at different times. Yeah. Uh, and I think the African Union could be a really important actor in trying to sort of underscore the fact that, look, you're going to have to talk with these folks at some point. Yeah. Even if you push them into Cameroon, even if you push them into Niger, uh, they're going to be around. They're yeah. going to be a, a, an ongoing force. Uh, there needs to be some sort of political process uh, and that's something that uh, a regional actor uh, like the AU has the expertise 
uh, to really be able to support yeah. something like that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. One, yeah, just one more thing, sort of a, a caveat, or a, in, in sort of caveat my response uh, to, to Professor Robinson's question. I think uh, certainly if you look at, if you look at the merging of peacekeeping agendas, agendas in Africa and counterterrorism agendas, so in, in the place, uh, for instance, uh, Somalia, right? This is, you know, certainly one could on the surface make the argument that the African Union is aggressively involved through its peacekeeping mission. It is an Amazon, it's an African Union mission, yeah. is aggressively involved in counterterrorism, combating sure. al-Shabaab in sure. Somalia. I say on the surface, though, because when, when you look at the structure of that initiative, it's entirely funded by external parties. Sure. The EU, uh, there's an EU mechanism, the United Nations, we know the United States plays a pretty critical role um, in facilitating MSOM operations in Somalia through drones and special operations, et cetera. So it is, you know, you see the, the appearance of African involvement or sort of African agenda on counterterrorism in a place like Somalia, but, uh, but it's real ownership I don't think is, is there. Okay, so um, another question from our audience, um, sort of AU related, but not. Um, uh, uh, the, the simple question is, does the West infantilize Africa? And, and that question, of course, comes from um, the um, chair of the um, AU Commission, um, Musa Faki Mahamat, who made the uh, statement to um, his EU delegates and his American delegates who um, um, proposed, um, you know, a U.S.-Africa strategy um, for the continent, um, but uh, made as part of the contingent clause that um, Africans um, should stay away from China because China is uh, neo-colonizing it. And so um, the response by the African Union chair at the time was, um, you know, do not infantilize us. Uh, we choose our own partners, and this has been going around social media, um, you know, and so I wanted our uh, panelists to comment uh, on that. Does the West infantilize Africa? <laughs> Looks like Sindiso has a... <laughs> Everybody's making faces up here. <laughs> Don't know if that means they want to answer. <laughs> Well, uh, one of the questions I um, oftentimes um, think about and uh, uh, I'm really interested in is the politics of representation mm -hmm. um, of Africa and the African continent. Um, but but uh, a warning um, that I want to um, really emphasize is that um, both Africa and the West are heterogeneous, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so there are some um, Western approaches and um, uh, towards Africa, policies um, towards Africa, um, and approaches that actually do infantilize Africa and other, the continent and its communities and populations. Mm -hmm. um, but also we must think about, um, you know, uh, social movements and other actors um, in the West and elsewhere that actually uh, are engaging um, at the African continent in productive ways. So yep. In a nutshell, this sure. is Sure, yeah, good answer. Yep, Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of, of of two views about, I actually didn't hear the speech, but I, I remember seeing this statement on, on Twitter. Um, I, he posted it to his Twitter account. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and so, so I'm of two views. I mean, on the one hand, I mean, I think it's, it's true. I mean, he's making these statements in the context of increased external involvement in Africa, right? If we look at the China factor, I mentioned in the Horn a number of Arab countries. This is a big issue. I mean in the African Union, it's a big topic of conversation. Um, if any of you have seen the United States like new uh, national security or new strategy for Africa, yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, it is, it is entirely about uh, uh, sort of countering China. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a main focus, right? So this is a context in which he's making these, these statements. And on, one, on, on the one hand, I think it's important to understand, yes, uh, there are a lot of big players with influence in the continent, uh, external players in the continent sort of doing what they're doing. but. Africans, African leaders, uh, African states also have a lot of agency, right? Um, and w one of the problems I think sort of typical of sort of analyses of the Cold War was this kind of, the kind of just ignoring the kind of incentives, the agencies, the interests of Africans uh, and African governments in terms of how they were operating. I mean, they, they understand the game of international politics. They're relevant. Uh, and so I think that, you know, so I think that's, his, his statements are corrective on that level. 
Uh, on the other hand, I don't think we could ignore the, the inequality that exists uh, in just as a matter of international politics between African states um, and, uh, and countries like China, the United States, uh, a variety of middle powers. We can't yeah, ignore that. France. That's, yeah, France, absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That is, the, that is a relevant issue that has to be discussed. If we look at the, the structural inequities between the African Union in the, in, the Euro, in the European Union, which are engaging on all kinds of issues. I mentioned my, migration and others. I mean, <laughs> you know, how does one have a, a conversation with another interna international organization as equals when they are paying your bills? Yeah. Right? It's, it's very difficult. So that, mm -hmm. that has to be, I, I understand this point, but like we also have to recognize hard realities. Go ahead. So, um, I mean, uh, when I heard those remarks, I wasn't particularly surprised, especially because um, I don't know if people saw this, but like I want to say like seven, nine, ten years ago, um, there was an opinion piece that was a, a sort of satirical piece in the Mail and Guardian in South Africa that um, was titled something or, or opened with something like, Hello, kitty, kitty, kitty. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was essentially the narrative and critique of the ways in which the West actually speaks to Africa and says, um, and basically treats them like they're their pet, right? It's like, oh yeah, no, you shouldn't let China come and do all of these terrible things to you. We're the only ones who you should let help you. Um, and of course, when we help you, we're only doing it for your benefit, never mind the fact that we're exploiting you shamelessly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is, is I think it's not a new narrative, right? Um, and I think the reason why it keeps returning is because there is some truth there. And so essentially what, what Michael was saying. Um, and and I, I mean, I think, so the work that I've done, which I didn't mention in my introduction, a lot of the work that I've done has been with um, land rights groups, um, especially in rural communities that have been severely impacted by extractive industry and mining and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there's a lot of Chinese activity and a lot of um, you know, activity that's coming, that um, you see in those spaces that isn't from the West, but there's also a lot that is from the West. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it, it, in some ways it does leave you wondering, okay, on what basis then does the West say, hey, beware of China because their, um, you know, their, their uh, intentions are not good Right, whereas actually um, the West's intentions aren't always necessarily good, and yeah. so I think it does boil down in the at the end of the day to that point about agency um, and recognizing that actually there. Uh, some of these things actually hold intention, continuity, and change, right? And so I think the reference to the Cold War is an apt one because, so for instance, coming from the South African perspective, um, you know, within the context of the struggle against apartheid, um, that, that, you know, South Africa is sort of picking sides in some ways between Russia and America and saying, we're actually going to accept, um, you know, resources from Russia was itself a way of exercising agency and saying, yes, we're going to do what we need to do for our own survival, and right now, this is support that they are giving us that we are not able to get from you. Um, and so I guess, like, I mean, I think the reality is that all of these sort of global political things are, are very political. Um, and, and as with any instance, groups are making choices based on um, opportunities and challenges and threats and um, you know, possibilities that they see and, and the calculus you know, shifts from time to time. And so I think that to the extent that the West is um, infantilizing Africa, it's probably um, because it's not recognizing the fact that actually Africa or Africans are able to make intelligent decisions and recognize the fact that West isn't, the West isn't a benevolent, um, you know, sort of benefactor in all instances. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for just a few more questions, but um, here's a nice one. Um, who won the 2018 World Cup um, held in Russia? Africa or France? <laughs> That's a globalization question. <laughs> it's a trick question. <laughs> it is a trick question. Let's see how we get out of it. Both. <laughs> Both? Yes. Go ahead, Sadiso. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I, I think, um, Pearl, you said it's a globalization question, and I think that's right, right? So um, France technically won, according to the rules um, of uh, FIFA. But um, actually, I mean, when you look at the representation, right, then you have to recognize that uh, a lot of that is the sort of brain drain from Africa. Um, and so in that sense, I think you do have to say that it's both. Um, but yeah, I'll leave that to my, my other colleagues to respond. What about that? Um, what do you mean, uh, Pearl? It's a globalization question. Go ahead, well, expand, if, elaborate. Uh, to the extent that we are citizens of the world and we can't, the people with talent supposedly go where the opportunities are, that's why France won. But I actually want to weigh in on the, looking at this from the, another side here in the United States. So there are many things that upset me <laughs> these days. And uh, one of the things that's really upset me at Tufts, uh, one of my advisees, I've been his advisor since his first semester at Tufts, he's now a second semester junior. And he said to me just before the last day of our class in Seminar on African Political Economy, he said, Professor Robinson, I'm quitting the basketball team and I'm the sole remaining black. I just can't take it anymore. The, the culture there in terms of how they treat black athletes, I just can't take it anymore. And he said, I've been playing basketball since I was six years old. And then he said to me, and there are no girls. There are no women on the, the women's basketball, no black women on the, the women's basketball team. And I have said this to several people at Tufts. There is something wrong in a school where black kids can't come and play basketball, and nobody thinks there is anything wrong with it. And then, yes, this week, last week, I don't know what day of the week it is now, but Tufts female basketball team just won the tra championship, and there on the front page, there are all of these white female basketball players. So who is winning, you know, who won the basketball champion for women at Tufts? And at a point in time when they're wringing their hands over blackface and they're, tr they're paying diversity people to come and talk about white fragility as a way of dealing with the racial problems at Tufts. So this may not belong here, but it's one of these things that really bothers me. So I'm glad that these global Africans won the, you know, won the World Cup for France. And maybe Tufts can get into you know, the global world at some point. Well, um, what about the um, um, current um, African migrant crisis in Europe? And how can we talk about that um, in the context of the ongoing debate between France and Italy? I don't know if you're following that, but Italy um, accusing France of neo-colonialism. This is Italy accusing France of the neo-colonialism of Africa and, and uh, France pulling back its, um, its ambassadors uh, because of that. But um, there is this dispute over, um, on the one hand, the African migrant um, debacle is a tragedy, really. Um, over 2,000 people have died in the Mediterranean um, and in the Sahara, you know, uh, trying to get to Europe from West Africa. Um, on the other hand, the inhumane treatment that um, refugees get these days all over the world. Um, you know, um, in this case, um, France first accused Italy of not um, accepting the um, migrants, um, the refugees, and Italy um, shot back saying that um, the reason why so many refugees are leaving, um, especially French Africa, is because of France's ongoing colonial economy, um, which it, it sort of weakens um, West African economies, and that's the reason why the migrants are leaving in the first place. That is an ongoing debate, everyone. So panelists, give us something. <laughs> Wants to do some work. 
<laughs> no, I actually can say that one of the reasons people in these, there's a, a job crisis in these years is there are lots of places where people can't work anymore. There used to be a desert tourist economy. Hmm. And all the people who were involved in that, you know, that's just completely wiped out because it's too dangerous for tourists. Hmm. Uh, friends, I had, you know, little, little lodges and uh, the tours and, and all of that is wiped out. So that I actually, in making my movie, I actually uh, worked with uh, a Nigerian filmmaker who lives on the edge of the desert in Tawa. So I would ride the bus, eight, hour, eight to 11 hour bus ride from Niamey up to Tawa with these, with these young men who were trying to get up there to Agadez to walk across the desert and I would listen to their stories. People starting even in Gambia and going up there. Okay. And I just, that, that, so that's one of the Sure, things. so one that's one strain. Language. Anybody else? Okay. Nada? Yeah, actually, so uh, the question about football um, in France mm -hmm. and who won the World Cup um, is a good um, way to approach the immigration the crisis. Yeah, mm -hmm. this particular crisis. Yeah. And um, I think that uh, we must ask what are, you know, why do African young men and women, for example, um, oftentimes decide to leave um, their countries. Obviously, there is a debate about brain circulation. This mm -hmm. is how I would like to, yeah. I like to call it. Uh, you know, but um, there are, um, you know, young uh, men and women who uh, really use very dangerous, um, you know, roads to get to Europe, for example. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, in one way, we should really think about the structural inequalities within um, African countries, which are the product of um, you know, colonization and, um, you know, contemporary neo-colonial relations with uh, France, uh, Britain, and other parts, um, you know, of Europe and elsewhere, uh, when we think about the factors that uh, prompt uh, young uh, people to leave. Yeah, you know. yeah, thank you. And I guess, well, I guess I would say that actually I agree with Nada, and I, I would say that even the last three questions are actually very related, right? In so far as the West infantilizing Africa, um, whether France or Africa won the World Cup and, and the migrant crisis, I think they are all connected. And so because of the fact that, um, you know, the fact that France um, uh, wins the World Cup on the backs of Africans, um, and yet those Africans are not very welcome in France and experience extreme racism and rejection and are reminded that they are not French, right? Um, is part of the problem. I think that there needs to be a sort of renewed narrative about um, migration and about the impacts of globalization um, that allows for people who do move, um, whatever their circumstances, uh, to be embraced and to be welcomed in, in countries that actually are very complicit in people's needing to move in the first place. And so I think that that's where, um, uh, you know, the inequities that Nada is talking about are also really important to think about because, you know, on the one hand, if you help um, France to win the World Cup, then you are, you know, celebrated in, in whatever terms, right, um, as a public figure. But um, people, your people, or people from, you know, the continent that you come from, or the countries that you come from, um, are not treated as people when in fact they are in crisis yeah. and in need of, um, you know, a new place, largely because of, or partly because of the influence of countries such as France. Sure. So, uh, Michael, just very quickly, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I, mean I, wor I work on a part of Africa that's really central to the migration crisis, if you look at the, the flow of people and where these people are actually coming from. Um, I mean, certainly, I mean, when I first saw the, the statement by, I think it was the Italian Deputy Prime Minister yep. and some other, yeah. I, mean, I thought it was absurd Legit. because Italy, as you know, Italy has its own colonial legacy in Africa, mm -hmm. in Libya in particular, which is quite relevant sure. uh, to this whole issue. Um, and, and so uh, it just, it, it, seemed, uh, it, it seemed pretty absurd to me. And of course, those that are making this, this argument against France are themselves, I mean, it's not coming from a genuine place. They're right-wing politicians yep. uh, looking to, uh, you know, basically attack the French government because they, they, they don't want to pursue a more aggressive sort of strategy of blocking the migrants, essentially, right? right? 
from France's perspective, it's not as big a deal because they're not taking in the same number of migrants as Italy, okay? Yeah. So there's self-interest. But I think, look, I mean, the EU strategy uh, for dealing with, Europe's strategy for dealing with this, it's embedded in something called the Khartoum process, which has been ongoing, I think, is a dismal failure in many ways, is to basically pay uh, uh, political actors in Africa, governments in some cases, militias in others, if you think about Libya, to basically hold on to these migrants, right? To be to be basically their border police, right? Uh, but not at Europe's borders, within Africa. Um, and, uh, and the problem here is that the migration crisis, in my view, is, is, is a byproduct of a long-term governance crisis in a number of African states. We could, we could talk about the particulars of the countries that are, that are at the heart of this crisis. And, and Europe country, European countries have been complicit in this. Uh, and so uh, the problem, though, from Europe's perspective is they want a short-term fix. Uh, to this issue, right? They want to do this overnight. It's an immediate crisis for them. But this is a long-term, we have to have a long-term conversation about root causes and about how one, how one uh, uh, you know, produces better governance context in Africa, right? And that's, that's not, that's not a, a two-month or one-year conversation. It's something that has to be going on over time. And Europe has to, Europe has some obligation to support that, but that's not what they're doing, right? And that's, that's at the crux of the problem, in my view. Thank you. Um, now, just to be democratic, um, like a good African, um, I have one question here, which is not part of our questions, even though that's not part of the rules. Um, but this person is saying, I protest your rules. And I have a question that is self-authored. And so I just want to um, you know, give you um, access. Um, and that person is Dr. Agwo Tata. Uh, will you stand up, please, and acknowledge that you have protests um, happens <laughs> and works? Okay, and so um, he wants to know, and if just one person could respond, please, because I have a last question, and then we have to um, expire. Um, how do we con con deconstruct the culture of dependency in Africa? <laughs> That's why, um, Professor Tata, where are you? Oh, there you are. It's a hard one. Do you do you have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> you have any ideas? <laughs> you, you want to hear from the esteemed yeah. panelists? Yeah. Jason, go ahead and the mic. Okay, any ideas about how to um, deconstruct the culture of dependency uh, in Africa? And if you don't, um, I think Professor Tata over there has some answers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You want to give it a, no, you should. Seriously. Girl, you should start us and then we'll go down the line. She's eating. Oh, no. I, <laughs> I was waiting for him to say something. So. I, you know, I, my big thing is agency. Agency. And it exists all over Africa, and you can see it. The problem seems to be that the people who have agency are not empowered. exercising it in small spaces. Yeah. And the people who control big spaces, maybe to control these big spaces, they need external funding. But to me, yeah. the question is, how does one continue to sustain those sort of little islands of agency and enable them to connect with each other? OK. Go ahead. Well, I would just add, and I, I fully agree with that, I guess I would just add also that, you know, in terms of creating the spaces, um, I think we need to interrogate a lot of the existing sort of structures and systems um, that make up the sort of global political economy, uh, global political economic environment in which people do have to exercise their agency. Because, you know, in the places where I work, some of what I see is people are trying really hard to exercise their agency, but they keep meeting with barriers and get shut down, you know, by discourses or um, structural arrangements that will not allow for their conceptions of what you know, uh, the good life is or for their conceptions of what development and success are. And so I think we need to create greater capacity within the systems that are in place to support um, people exercising their agency in ways that are true for them. And I guess for me, it goes back in, in part to what I was saying earlier about Africa rising and Africa needing to be able to rise on its own terms, according to its own definitions, rather than as sort of constrained by these dominant narratives um, that tend often to be sort of crafted outside of the African context. Michael or, or Darren? Oh. 
please. Sir. Sure. Well, um, maybe I'll, I'll just go uh, before Michael, only to say I wanted to, to underscore a point Michael just made and Sindiso as well in terms of the, the importance of the governance question really in, in getting at this and several of the other questions we, we've spoken of already uh, in the sense that I think that a big piece of this is democratic deepening uh, across the continent. I think as you get more representative governments, I think it gets harder and harder for, uh, you know, an authoritarian or semi-authoritarian government to sell the country, you know, uh, down the river because they are more responsible. And even in Nigeria, which is uh, certainly, I think, moving along in terms of its democratic strength, uh, you've seen a number of of global deals you know, with China and other places that have come under real scrutiny and where local leaders have faced some real heat uh, because uh, voters and other civil society actors felt like uh, this was only underscoring the dependency uh, factors that, we, you know, that, that we're, we're concerned about. So um, I, I think that, uh, that the more that, that we see um, that kind of sort of democratization role, it'll be really important. And I, would, I think I'd really also underscore on this point uh, the special role that Nigeria and South Africa, I think, play in, in this whole picture. I think uh, those are the two countries that have at least uh, the greatest potential uh, to really break out. I think Nigeria itself is not particularly donor dependent uh, because of its oil wealth. It's oil dependent in that sense. So it's, it's dependent on global market fluctuations, uh, but it's able to thumb its nose at international actors uh, in a way that a lot of other countries on the continent can't. And I think if Nigeria gets its own house increasingly in order, which I think it's heading in the right direction over the long term. And then South Africa, of course, I think fits also into that picture in terms of being able to be in you know, more of a, of a driver's seat role. Uh, and then the two of those together, I think, have a special role in perhaps bringing the rest of the continent along. Great. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Uh, You're fine. Yeah. OK. Um, I think um, I've got this time for this last question, and it's a closing question. One minute each of you, if you don't mind, or even less than that, because that makes five minutes. Um, but it is a thematic question, and um, we ask you to sort of think about, um, does Africa need to be a country? Is Pan-Africanism necessary? Um, was Kwame Nkrumah right? So, you know, is Pan-Africanism even necessary? Um, I'll just say my, I'll start first. I think Nyerere was right. Nyerere was right, not, not um, Kwame. That's right. Explain um, to this audience, please, the uh, difference. You know, six regional groups, six countries, but not the whole continent. Okay. Regionalism, um, sub-regionalism, not you know um, totalitarian regionalism. Well, <laughs> okay. It's, total Pan it's just hard to manage a whole continent. Yeah. Okay, continent. Michael. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think sort of thinking about Africa as, as a country is probably realistic, um, but certainly Pan-Africanism is essential, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you think about bargaining power, um, dealing with the rest of the world. Um, China, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, China has a very deliberate strategy of dealing bilaterally Absolutely. with African countries. And there's a reason for that, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and certainly th the range of challenges the continent faces require cooperation across states. We're talking about climate change, terrorism, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, so so I think, I think pan-Africanism, if you think about shared solidarities, linked fate, some vision of like a common future, um, that's essential, right? But um, but sort of Africa as a country is not particularly realistic at this juncture. Okay. Um, Nada. I think I, I agree with what uh, uh, Michael uh, just said. And um, I think that uh, at the cultural level, it is possible to think and imagine, uh, you know, like a, a pan-Africanism that is productive and, um, um, you know, that, that would actually um, uh, address some of the challenges that we have been discussing this afternoon. Um, I uh, want to maybe take a few seconds to address the question about dependency, right? So from the, from the perspective of development theories, for example, um, you know, uh, the, the dependency theory or the dependency argument was a response to, um, you know, uh, constructions of development as merely economic growth and modernization and so on, right? So, and it emerged in a specific um, historical moment emerged in Latin America and then spread to other parts of um, the global south. And so there are new um, you know, uh, ways of articulating um, uh, some of the challenges that Africa, but also other parts of the global south face these days. And we may and may not agree on these um, right ideas, such as um, you know, like uh, the development alternative option which uh, involves building solidarities, right? Building uh, like social movements and 
building, um, uh, you know, like mobilizing communities around certain ideas, and the idea of pan-Africanism is attractive in that way. Um, and or alternatives to development, you know, doing away with development altogether. Thank you. Cindisa? Um, I think I, I largely agree with Michael's point. Um, I guess I'm going to uh, sort of push the envelope to the more extreme side again by um, suggesting that actually, um, even though it's not realistic within the short or medium term, um, I think maybe we need to be thinking about even just reconceptualizing the whole state system. Um, and so um, that would be an issue not just for Africa and whether Africa should be a country, but the world. Because I think that, um, for a start, one of the solutions to the migrant crisis um, would be to be thinking about nationality in very different terms to the way that we think about it today. And so, um, yeah, even though it's not immediately realistic, um, I would think that this is something that we should be thinking about not just in Africa, but um, across the globe. Thank you. Darren, last word. Yeah, I'm speaking as, a, as an outsider. Um, I, I would definitely um, uh, agree with the, the regional approach. Uh, makes the most sense to me. But um, having spent a lot of time in Nigeria, it's been very interesting. Uh, of course, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see Nigeria become more Nigerian um, uh, in, before it you know, becomes even <laughs> uh, sort African. of a, a larger um, entity in the <laughs> sense that you know, subnational identities are still very much stronger in many ways than Nigerian entity uh, identity is, rather. But what's been interesting, and as I've been learning over the years about Nigeria, is how important the Pan-African identity has become within Nigeria as an important balancing factor to all the failures of Nigerianness in the sense that Nigeria is this sort of corrupt thing. It's the place where all these elite people go and steal all our money. But Pan-Africanism is an identity that also sort of provides a balance to that. It, it represents an, an ideal of, of things that are larger than Nigeria, but is not global. And so, um, and, and how it's been a really important motivating factor, particularly in the younger generation. Um, the younger generation who are, are completely tied in with their smartphones uh, and internet technology to everything going on in the world, I think Pan-Africanism is going to be just as important or even more important in, in that regard uh, in, in the years to come. Thank you very much, our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Excellent, excellent job. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause.